We tend to think of stars as distant and largely mysterious objects. Even through binoculars or a backyard telescope, stars look like tiny pinpricks of light, and it seems incredible that we could ever learn anything about the physics and inner workings of such faraway things. The work that stellar astronomers have done is incredible, but we also have one star, just one, that we can explore in extraordinary detail, our Sun. The Sun has been an immense font of information about physics, astronomy and the inner workings of stars, changing our understanding of everything from particle physics to the seismology of the stellar interiors. It's so close and so bright that it's unsafe to look directly at it with our eyes, but in this programme we can draw on a great deal of heroic research on our nearest star and take a good look at our own Sun. By stellar standards, our Sun is amazingly, incredibly ordinary. Its size, its mass, its temperature, its age, all of these fundamental properties place it smack in the average category when it comes to the population of stars. Still, compared to our own planet, it can seem like a pretty extreme environment. It's a hundred times the size of the Earth, and 300,000 times as massive. It is 93 million miles away, and the light of the sun takes over 8 minutes to make the trip from the star's surface to us. The surface of the sun is almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, unimaginably hot by our standards but tepid compared to many stars. And if we could somehow withstand such heat and visit the sun, we would weigh 30 times as much as we do on Earth. I certainly don't need that. The surface of the Sun might sound like an odd concept. After all, the Sun is made of incredibly hot gas and plasma, so there's no solid rock like the Earth's crust to get our footing on. When astronomers talk about stars, the word surface means something slightly different. To us, the surface of a star refers to the point at which a photon has a pretty decent chance of escaping the star and heading out into the solar system. Put another way, it's the part of the star we can see. A photon produced in the centre of the Sun by nuclear fusion churning away in its core has to fight its way out through the Sun's incredibly hot and dense interior. A journey that could take a photon anywhere from a hundred thousand years to almost a million years as it pings and scatters off the densely packed atoms in the inner layers. In such a crowded environment, the photon's mean free path, that is, the distance it is able to travel in a straight line before bumping into or interacting with something, is incredibly small. Once it's finally able to escape and begin the trip to Earth in one straight shot, it's reached what we call the Sun's surface, or its photosphere. Observing and understanding the surface of the Sun makes sense. We've just literally defined it as what we can see. But how can we possibly know anything about the Sun's interior? Like most stars, we can make a guess as to how the Sun's core behaves based on what we know about the composition and evolution of the stars. But we can't see the core and its inner layers. So, how can we know anything about its densities and temperatures? One way is through something called astroseismology. This is exactly what it sounds like, the stellar equivalent to how seismology works here on Earth. In our own planet we can study how waves propagate from events like earthquakes to study the internal structure of the Earth identifying things like our molten core and the density of the mantle and the crust. We can do similar things with stars by watching how they pulse. A pulsating star is sending waves propagating through the star and with detailed observations we can identify those waves and use them to discern details like the density of its deep stellar layers. We do this for the Sun and can even manage this for more distant stars by studying them very closely, to identify changes in their shapes and size caused by pulsations. However, for the Sun in particular, we have a second tool available for studying its interior, neutrinos. Neutrinos are pretty unusual subatomic particles. 
they have no electrical charge and appear to be incredibly tiny. Remember the photons that could take hundreds and thousands of years to pinball their way out from the center of the sun? Neutrinos are so small that they can pass straight through those same dense layers that act like an obstacle course for light. Neutrinos from the sun are streaming to and even through the earth and through you right now. However, they interact with atoms so rarely that for years it was incredibly difficult to study them and we didn't know some of the most basic facts about them like what their mass was or whether they even had a mass at all. Still, they're pretty valuable messengers coming from the centre of the sun, so physicists recognised decades ago that studying neutrinos could hold the key to understanding how the sun and other stars work. One long-standing puzzle specifically concerned the neutrinos coming to Earth from the sun's core. By the 1970s we knew that a star like our sun would be fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. We also knew that the chemical reactions involved in this fusion should release neutrinos and that some of these neutrinos should make their way to Earth. If we could detect these neutrinos it would serve as a potent test of our basic understanding of how stars worked, giving us a window into the workings of the sun's core. Detecting neutrinos might seem pretty impossible if they're so non-interactive, but it's possible, and in the late 1960s astrophysicist John Bacall and Raymond Davis Jr. designed an experiment specifically aimed at studying neutrinos from the Sun. John Bacall was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, and didn't dream of the stars growing up, he was an athlete who went to college on a tennis scholarship and originally studied philosophy with an eye on potentially becoming a rabbi. A physics course taken as a graduation requirement at the University of California at Berkeley changed all that. And Bacall went on to earn degrees in physics from Berkeley, the University of Chicago and Harvard doing research at Indiana University and Caltech before ultimately becoming a professor at Princeton University. Raymond Davis Jr. grew up in Washington DC and studied physical chemistry. He served in the army during World War II and in the years after took a job at Brookhaven National Laboratory, a laboratory established after the war by a consortium of universities on land owned by the Atomic Energy Commission. The mission of the laboratory was to support peaceful research on atomic energy and nuclear physics. Bakul had carried out theoretical predictions for astronomers' standard model of how the sun should work, including precise estimates of how many neutrinos should be detected coming from the sun's core. Davis set about building an innovative detector that could test these predictions using a 100,000 gallon tank of tetrachloroethylene, the same chemical compound commonly used today in dry cleaning. Davis' philosophy was simple. The tank should occasionally catch a neutrino from the sun that would interact with one of the chlorine atoms in the tank and transform it into an argon atom. If Davis simply set up the tank and waited, argon atoms should slowly begin appearing in the tank. However, on the surface of the Earth the experiment would prove too messy, with other subatomic particles zipping around that could also potentially interact with the contents of the tank. The solution was to bury the tank deep under the Earth's surface, about a mile deep in a laboratory attached to the Homestake Gold Mine in South Dakota, where only neutrinos coming from the sun should be able to cause reactions. The experiment worked wonderfully, and argon atoms began appearing in the tank. Davis purged the tank and counted the argon atoms, and came up with the wrong answer. John Bacall had predicted that the tank should gain a little more than one argon atom per day from neutrino interactions, but Davis was finding only one argon atom every couple of days. 
It came out to a number of neutrinos that was only about one third of the number predicted by the astronomer's model of the Sun. Davis and Bacall both checked and rechecked their work. The experiment was fine, and the mass was correct. Other experiments began getting the same results, including an immense detector in Japan called Kamio Kandi. Together they definitely proved that the sun was producing neutrinos, but the puzzle of why they weren't finding enough neutrinos remained. What was going wrong? Was there something fundamentally wrong with our model of the sun? As it turned out, there was actually something fundamentally quirky about neutrinos. Neutrinos come in three different types, referred to by particle physicists as flavours. They are electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos. The three flavours refer to subtle differences in the chemical reactions that produce these neutrinos and the chemical reactions that they can participate in. McCall's and Davis's detector could only detect electron neutrinos and it wasn't finding enough of them. Were the electron neutrinos missing? Or had they oscillated, as subatomic particles sometimes do, into other flavours, becoming muon or tau neutrinos that would get missed by the neutrino detectors of the day? The Sudbury Neutrino Observatory provided the answer in 2001. Like Raymond Davis's experiment, it was buried in a mine, 1.3 miles below the Earth's surface inside a nickel mine in Ontario, Canada. The observatory consisted of an enormous sphere that could hold 1,000 metric tons of a compound known as heavy water. Heavy water is made of an oxygen atom with two deuterium atoms, that is, hydrogen atoms with neutrons added to their cores. That deuterium was crucial. It would react with electron neutrinos, just like the chlorine atoms in Davis's experiment, but would also react with muon and tau neutrinos. Each of these reactions would give off a brief burst of light, so the sphere was lined with detectors that could report the telltale flash of neutrino interaction. When this experiment began operating, it detected all three flavours of neutrino, and the results were spectacular. They matched John Bacall's predictions and directly demonstrated that the astronomer's model of the Sun's core was correct. The observations also proved a crucial property of neutrinos. They were oscillating in flavour. Prior to this discovery, many physicists had believed that neutrinos were massless objects, but the flavour oscillations changed all this. A neutrino's flavour is determined by different quantum combinations of neutrino mass properties. If a neutrino's flavour can change, it means that those mass properties must be non-equal, since combining them differently leads to different results. And if those mass properties were all zero, then they'd all be equal. The fact that we see those flavours changing tells us that neutrinos must have at least some tiny amount of mass. The research led to Nobel Prizes in Physics in 2002 and 2015, recognising Raymond Davis as well as Arthur MacDonald of the Sudbury Observatory, and Masatoshi Kashiba and Takakaki Kajita from Kamio Kandi. Astrophysicists had disentangled a long-standing mystery of particle physics and tested a fundamental model of how stars work, all thanks to the Sun. Neutrinos act as a convenient window into the core of the Sun, but when it comes to the Sun as a whole it might seem surprisingly hard for astronomers to study, simply because it's so incredibly bright. The telescope designs we've talked about in the past programmes are all starved for photons and are designed to carefully capture every crumb of light that comes their way from faint and distant objects. Pointing one of these telescopes at the sun sounds ridiculous or even downright dangerous. 
Designing a good solar telescope means tackling several challenges unique to the study of the Sun. The first difficulty is that the observations need to happen during the day. This may sound obvious, and even pretty convenient, but during the daytime atmospheric turbulence is worse thanks to the sun heating the ground, which could badly blur the pictures that are taken. Solar telescopes can also get incredibly hot if they're not managed correctly. The telescopes need to be cooled and need to avoid capturing any sunlight beyond what they need for their data. Finally, solar telescopes don't need or even want large mirrors, but large mirrors do help most telescopes capture very sharp and clear images. This means that solar telescopes are typically quite tall, staying away from the heat of the ground and basically built in towers. They're also kept cool inside, with the light from the sun focused through helium gas or a vacuum to help avoid heating the ambient air that travels through it, which could also blur the image. Some of these telescopes are also very long. Longer telescopes, much like wide telescopes, produce sharper images. Solar telescopes are able to observe the sun's surface in incredible detail. If we take a look at an image of the sun's surface using the same wavelengths we detect with our eyes, at first glance it might not seem that impressive. It actually might look a little grainy. But those grains, they're real. If we zoom in, way in, we can see that those aren't just blurred spots from the image, they're actual spots on the surface of the sun. These small patches are called granules and some can be as small as 20 miles across. What we're actually seeing is the very edge of a layer of our sun where the temperature and density conditions produce convection, the phenomenon where hotter materials rise and colder materials sink under the influence of gravity. You've seen something like this when you've peered into a pot of boiling water. Hot bubbles will rise to the surface, then cool and dissipate and drop back down again into the pot. These granules are the protruding tops of convection cells on our sun's surface. The bright centres show us the hot gas rising to the top of the cell, while the dark edges show us cool gas sinking back down. Close-ups of the sun's surface require carefully designed solar telescopes and observing technique. But there's one fantastic way to observe the sun, or at least part of the sun, without any specialised equipment at all, during a total solar eclipse. In a total solar eclipse, the Earth's moon perfectly blocks our view of the sun's surface, making for an incredible observing experience for anyone lucky enough to be in the path of the moon's shadow. During totality, we do get a spectacular view of one part of the Sun, the solar corona, white hot plasma with a temperature of about 2 million degrees Fahrenheit that can reach many thousands of miles above the Sun's surface. For casual eclipse observers, viewing the solar corona is a rare and incredible sight. But for solar astronomers, eclipses offer a rare opportunity to study the detailed geometry, physics and chemistry of the solar corona and the magnetic field of the sun itself, which drives the corona's appearance and shape. Astronomers have been chasing eclipses for years, as Arthur Eddington did when he confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity by observing stars near the Sun during an eclipse in 1919. One of the first people to combine eclipse chasing expeditions with digital imaging technology was astronomer Shadida Habul. Habul was born in Damascus, Syria. Her mother was a language teacher and her father was an education and psychological professor at the University of Damascus. Her interest in physics began in her teenage years thanks to an advanced and engaging high school physics class and a biography of Marie Curie. 
Habal studied physics at the University of Damascus and the University of Beirut before moving to the United States for a doctorate from the University of Cincinnati. Today Habal leads expeditions all over the world from Kenya to Mongolia to the Arctic Circle, chasing the paths of solar eclipses. Habal and her team carry all of the telescopes and cutting-edge imaging equipment that they need with them. With today's best observing cameras and filters, Habal can use these critical moments of totality to study things like iron atoms in the solar corona, which can trace temperature variations, map the sun's complex magnetic field, and offer clues linking how the sun looks and how the sun behaves. This last point is an important one. Studying the sun can tell us a great deal about the stars as a whole but it can also give us crucial information about the Sun itself, information that might prove particularly valuable to anyone living just a little over eight light minutes away. The magnetic field of the Sun holds crucial clues to understanding solar activity. If you've ever heard about sunspots or solar flares, then you have some familiarity with what solar activity means. Sunspots are cool patches that sometimes appear on the sun's surface, showing up as dark spots thanks to their lower temperatures. We think that sunspots form thanks to the sun's tangled magnetic field lines. To understand how this happens, take a look at the sun with standard magnetic fields drawn, connecting its north and south magnetic poles. It's a simple illustration, and the magnetic field lines look nice and neat. But we've forgotten something. The sun spins. It also spins at different rates, with the equator moving faster than the poles. This varying rotation distorts and curves the sun's magnetic field lines. You can try something simpler by picking up a piece of string and twisting it between your fingers in different directions. Eventually you'll see twisted loops pop out of the increasingly twisted string. These loops that you have made are a pretty good representation of how the sun's magnetic field can cause sunspots. Those magnetic field loops will sometimes protrude through the sun's surface, producing cool spots where they poke through, which we see as sunspots. This is why sunspots tend to come in pairs you'll see one spot associated with the end of the loop that's closer to the northern magnetic pole and another for the southern magnetic pole. The number of sunspots on the sun's surface increases and decreases on an 11 year cycle. The sunspots themselves make very little difference to anyone on Earth. They have only an extremely tiny effect on the sun's brightness so the solar cycle won't have any impact on things like our planet's climate and could never cause something as severe as climate change we've seen in recent years. Still, solar activity is worth understanding for another reason. The solar activity cycle also correlates with the number of solar flares and coronal mass injections that we see from the Sun. Solar flares are eruptive events that release light and charged particles, spectacular events that, if they're strong enough, can disrupt satellite communications. Coronal mass ejections have the potential to cause even more problems. These are explosions of material in the Sun's atmosphere that can send massive blasts of particles from the Sun's corona hurtling towards Earth. Solar astronomer Richard Carrington recorded an immense burst of solar activity in 1859 that became known as the Carrington Event. He first noted a large number of sunspots on the Sun's surface, followed by an enormous geomagnetic storm. At the time, the telegraph was the most widely used form of long-distance communication, and the storm was powerful enough to wreak havoc with the system. Some telegraph operators were shocked by their equipment, and communication towers hurled sparks. In desperation, some operators turned off their haywire equipment, 
only to realise that the telegraphs kept working even after being unplugged, suggesting that an eerie amount of charge was still present in the ambient air. Now imagine something on the scale of the Carrington event happening today. In a world where we're incredibly reliant on satellite communications and electronics, even with solar astronomers closely watching the sun, we wouldn't have much warning and there's not much we can do. Currently, emergency plans focus mostly on what to do in the aftermath, setting up emergency equipment to get our power grid back up and running. Until we can predict events like this well in advance and execute emergency shutdowns to keep our satellites and electronics safe, we're stuck with watching and waiting. Understanding solar activity, the sun's physical properties, its magnetic field, its corona and the workings of its interior and surface is crucial both for our understanding of solar physics and for our ability to explain and predict things like solar flares and coronal mass ejections. We talked a couple of programs ago about asteroids and meteors one of the only scenarios in which objects from space can impact literally life on Earth. Our Sun is another, fascinating and sometimes volatile neighbour in space and understanding how it works is crucial for our lives here on Earth as well. Today astronomers are studying the Sun in a myriad of different ways. We lead expeditions to observe solar eclipses use neutrino detectors and specialised telescopes to keep an eye on the sun inside and out, and we're even sending space probes to get incredible new and close-up views of the sun. We still have a lot of questions left to answer about the sun, but it certainly offers us a wealth of data to work with. The sun is so important to us in part because it's our sun, our closest star. The object that gave rise to the entire solar system that we call home. But what about other planets, ones far beyond our solar system, that might see another star as a sun? Those faraway planets, exoplanets, are what we'll be exploring next. Bye for now. Here's Montego Bay by Freddie Notes and the Rudies.